93. The interviewer is Julius Schwartz. Murphy, the Bible says in the beginning the Lord created the heavens and earth and so on. So I want, I want to talk about your beginning. Not necessarily where you were born. The beginning of your involvement in science fiction and what it led to. Uh, what was the thing that hooked you into science fiction? What started you off? Where were you? And tell us a little bit about it. Well, I was, I was a kid, and, and uh, I guess maybe second, third grade, and I had uh, had a love for comics uh, since I, you know, was three or four years old, I guess. And uh, and reading some of the comic sections, I came across Buck Rogers, and I was really turned on by the whole idea of uh, seeing the future. So I read some books in the, the library, and then, lo and behold, I, I discovered that uh, there were similar what books, stories. What books were those? In the school library, there were books that were written for kids, you know, they, and I don't ask me who they were, I can't remember. Were they short, maybe like Tom Swift, perhaps? No, they weren't Tom Swift. They were written uh, in a more uh, technical way. They were... Were they fiction? Uh, or? No, they were true science, but they were speculative things. What would happen if you went on a, a voyage to the sun or a voyage to the moon or what have you? And... Uh, so that, uh, I became very interested in the format, and I remember reading uh, uh, somewhere along uh, uh, about that time uh, uh, the, the Oz stories, and I got turned on to fantasy, and uh, then, uh, uh, lo and behold, I discovered that uh, there were books, uh, magazines, that carried stories of that nature that so weren't what comics. Are we, what year are we in now? I would say this is roughly... Uh, what year? Uh, yeah. Roughly uh, 1936, 37. Oh, so it's probably amazing stories that hooked you. No, it was a, just a, a story and a, 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 a book, as I recall, on airplanes. But uh, then I pursued it and found there were entire magazines uh, devoted to science fiction. That I, I didn't know the term science fiction then, but had that kind of subject matter. And then, you're right, I think Amazing Stories was my first uh, uh, well, skipping ahead, because I could hardly wait to hear the answer, then you obviously read about Anthony Rogers, Armageddon 2419, or whatever it was called, A.D. Did you read that in Amazing Stories? Well, years later, I discovered that, that oh, you uh, there was that connection. It, no. no, no, that was... Uh, uh, what was your reaction when you read the story about uh, Anthony Rogers going off into the 21st century? Oh, I, I love that... Uh, 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 origin for Buck Rogers. I thought that was a fantastic uh, uh, device. Now, how did it happen? What was your reaction when you were given or perhaps sought for the assignment to do Buck Rogers? How did that happen? Oh, well, it, that's a pretty involved story. Well, let's, let's we have plenty of time and devolve <laughs> it. Well, let's just put it this way. Uh, I had uh, already worked for Fiction House. I had worked in pulps and, you know, as, as well as comics. And uh, uh, then the Navy intervened. I went in the Navy and I was stationed in, in Chicago and uh, met my future wife. Mm -hmm. And after the war, I went back to Fiction House for a short time, but uh, then uh, decided I would move closer to Helen and uh, came back to Chicago and freelance for Fiction House. But uh, uh, I was always looking for something a little better to do than just doing comic book work. And I, and I used to read the ads religiously in the Chicago Tribune. And lo and behold... Why would you read the ads in the Chicago Tribune? The and one ads. The and one said, ads. And what, under what category would that be? Illustrators artists, or artists? Artists, just artists, and generally. What, and, I, and I found this listing our artist wanted to, to draw adventure comic strip, new adventure comic and, strip. And who put that ad in the paper? Well, they just gave a phone number. Mm -hmm. And I called and made an appointment and uh, went down for an interview. When I got there, I was surrounded by uh, drawings of Buck Rogers and uh, so forth in the little waiting room. Was that your first time you came across an illustration of Buck Rogers? Uh, yes, original and art. What was, your, what was your reaction? Oh, I, I was flabbergasted, and when I had the interview, they assured me it was for a new strip that had nothing to do with Buck Rogers. 
And, uh, but nevertheless, I was really greatly interested in doing any kind of a, a comic strip. And uh, as uh, I came back for further interviews, made some drawings and so forth, for, for which they paid me, uh, uh, little by little it became evident they were looking for a new artist on Buck Rogers. Who was and, doing Buck Rogers at that time? Well, Dick Calkins was still doing the dailies, yeah. and uh, Rick Yeager was doing the Were they the original uh, artists on the Buck Well, Rogers? Dick Calkins was the first artist, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, he was still doing... Russell Keaton uh, w uh, worked on the Sunday page, and I think Dick may have drawn uh, some of the early Sunday pages, but uh, Russell Keaton was in very, uh, in very soon uh, on that scene, and he drew them up uh, to the mid-30s, I think, 33, 34 at least, uh, when uh, uh, Rick Yeager was hired to do the Sunday page. Uh, let's get on with uh, Buck Rogers and we get that out of the way and get into other stuff. So, when did you get the job, the assignment to do Buck Rogers? When would that be about? 1947. And who wrote the story? Uh, they uh, were trying out writers, but the, uh, the writer of choice was a man named Bob Williams. Mm -hmm. And Bob was from uh, Kansas, from Wichita, Kansas. So he... Uh, was a little more of a natural for them than someone out in New York that might have been. Uh, now there was a science fiction writer called Robert Williams, Robert S. Williams. I was his agent for a while, and I vaguely recall he was in the, around the Illinois area. Could it possibly have been the same fellow? I really don't think so. Bob uh, uh, had written uh, uh, radio shows. He he, he uh, had written Sky King at uh -huh. one point, and uh, this was uh, during the war years. Of, or, or, Maybe pre-war that he had written that, that, uh, All right. that show. All right. So you were given the assignment, and uh, he were, you were told what special instructions were you given? Were you told to follow exactly what had been created before you? Were, were you able to make any changes? Uh, how, how oh no, no. The name of the game was they wanted to update Buck. They wanted uh -huh. to. But he did want to. Uh, yeah, they wanted me to draw. Uh, him as I saw him, and then we would go over all the stuff, Mr. Dilly and others that he might show. Mr. The Dilly took a personal interest oh, in this yes, Buck he Rogers. Was, oh, yes, Buck He considered Rogers himself the father of Buck Oh, Rogers. yes, absolutely. A quick interruption. I hope you know the answer, because I don't. As you know, the story originally dealt with Anthony Rogers. Who got the idea of calling him Buck Rogers and why? Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, I know that uh, that was Mr. Dilly's Dilly himself. Yeah. Uh, Buck Rogers. That's the, the you think he may have been inspired by the cowboy Buck Jones or any other Buck I'm sure. I, I'm sure that they felt Buck was a better, more, a more yeah, masculine more adventure name. Type, yeah. An adventure type name. Now, you're given your first assignment, you got a script. What was your reaction? What were your nerves as you started to illustrate that first panel? Well, it, I was cool? led into it. I was led into it very gently, you might say, yeah. because they had they put me on salary, and uh, I came in and worked, uh, well, worked almost in the every day, and uh, worked right in the office where Dick Calkins had had an office in, in years gone by, and uh, 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 <laughs> anyhow, they, they, the first uh, work that I did. Uh, was promotional type stuff. They asked me to draw cities as oh, I might I see. see them, mm -hmm. and draw uh, aircraft as a, you know, rocket craft yeah. as I might see it, and draw uh, pictures of Buck and Wilma and the, the lead characters as, uh, and clothe them and design costumes for for them that I felt. Were you allowed to make any changes at all, say in, in the facial features? Uh, you had to follow no, exactly no. As, I, uh, as a matter of fact, they wanted to change the whole concept. You know, I think maybe they wanted them to have uh, uh, non-black hair. You know, I mean, it could be colored, uh, well, sandy or blonde, however they wanted to color it. And uh, so they, they, they did have some guidelines, but basically they were just trying to fish out of me uh, and guide me to, to what they were looking for. Mr. Dilly was very much on top of the, the, the scene, and he... Uh, he often brought reference material in for me, stuff he'd clip out of magazines and so forth that uh, he felt could be useful in, in designing. Now, in doing, the, the, in doing the strip, did, did, did you do the lettering also? 
Well, I did the lettering uh, on some of the early tryouts, but it wasn't too good, so they, they, hired, they hired a letterer. How yeah. about the coloring? Who did the coloring on Well, that? on the dailies. I only did the dailies on Oh, that, you didn't do that, the Sundays no, at all? No, no, not at that time. Who was doing the Sundays at all? Rick Yeager okay. continued to do the Sundays. All right, that lasted how long? Uh, I worked for them uh, approximately on salary, uh, including all the time, approximately two and a half years. Uh, do you want to talk about why you left the strip? Did you have that interest? Or? Well, no, I'd rather not get into okay. that. Okay, it probably has nothing to do. Well, let's go back into the science fiction element when you started to read amazing stories and so on. Uh, when you, you had no desire, obviously, to be a writer. No. I, I must well, say, if I can interrupt, I thought I might be a writer, but I knew I had, I had no talent whatsoever. I certainly didn't have any artistic talent, so that was that. So well, I got involved in, in, in behind-the-scenes type of stuff. No. Let, let's back up a little on that. I, I was interested in writing my own material. Uh -huh. I guess I always was. And when I was in high school, I worked on the high school newspaper, and, and uh, my final... Uh, uh, a quarter, I guess it was, uh, of high school, I uh, was uh, actually the uh, co-editor of the, of the paper. Did you do any artistic work for the Oh, yes, I did drawing, but, but I also wrote stories oh. and covered events, and, uh, did, you know, I, I was, I could have comfortably had journalism as a, as a profession. I, I liked see. it. Now, this is in high school? Yes. In high now, school. you graduated from high school, and where did you go from there? Well, uh, at that point, I... Uh, 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 enrolled at the University of North Carolina and started... Well, what are you doing? We haven't discussed North Carolina up to this point. Uh, how did you wind up in North Carolina? Well, I was born in North well, Carolina. Well, that's a good that's enough a... reason for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I remember your father had the Blue Bay taxi cab uh, service down there. Uh, did you work for your father at all? Oh, yes. I worked for him as a kid, you know, doing things on weekends and when uh, after school. Uh, you know, he, he bought a mimeograph machine, and I would do forms for him and that sort of thing. And well, let's get into the artistic uh, element of all this. When did you feel that you had something inside you you had to put down on, on paper? Oh, well, the, the early comic books really turned did me you on try, Did you try to imitate any of the early comics? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, I guess Popeye was my first favorite, and I, I used to... Uh, Try to copy the Sunday pages line for line when they when we'd get the. You mean uh, you actually traced them? No, I I'd, oh. I'd set them, tried to redraw them. Oh, you know? I see. And uh, then uh, after that, I discovered the more realistic uh, drawing, and I would, uh, Now that uh, I'm thinking about it, I was quite impressed by by a freebie newspaper that the uh, Gulf Oil Company used to give away, mm -hmm. a little four-page uh, tabloid-sized paper. They gave cartoons away in it? Yes, there was four pages of cartoons, and one page devoted to each character, and it was sort of like tabloid Sunday pages. And they had a, f a feature called Wings Windfair, which was a, sort of a, an airplane strip, but it got into a fantasy element when he is stranded on a mesa somewhere in, in Mexico, and he encounters Aztec Indians and so forth. And uh, and with the the Aztec Indians, uh, there are some... Well, go ahead, go ahead. There are some uh, Spanish conquistadores that have been stranded there for centuries, too. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a, an interesting thing. And, and then I discovered Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon about the same time, and I was totally hooked on them. And since you felt so strongly about illustrating and drawing, did you have any professional training? Did you go to an art school? Or did you, how did you, how did you, how did you learn what to do? How did yeah. you, Really, okay. just by copying and... and uh, so your education was simply going to Satan illustrations and copying them? Basically that, yeah. trying to analyze them yeah. and, and, and make my own... And you had no special it. knowledge of anatomy, for example? Or? No, I, I, I did, as a kid, pick up a couple of books. Yeah. Uh, one was Andrew Loomis, uh, uh, who was a very well-known illustrator. He had a book out for beginning artists, and then he had a series of books, uh, which were very helpful. The first book was very uh, good because it uh, taught the very the basics how to uh, uh, construct figures and so forth. Well, uh, well, let's get into the good stuff now. As I recall, you did some work for Amazing Stories when Ray Palmer was editor. Well, that's Tell me how that started. 
Well, I was. So in, were you living in Chicago at that time? I was living in the Chicago uh, at uh, Uncle Sam's expense. Uh huh. Uh, I had come to Chicago under duress because I passed the Eddie test. Uh, the Navy uh, had a school uh, to uh, train uh, radio technicians who could work on radar. Mm -hmm. There was a great shortage of people that could could uh, repair all this very sophisticated for the time uh, radio gear they had. And uh, uh, they pulled Marines off the battlefield, actually. If they passed the test, they'd, they'd bring them back to the States to train them. Okay. Well, let's get into uh, the, let's get into let's get into Palm. I'm all right. But uh, I wound up uh, uh, in, uh, stationed in the Loop in Chicago, and of course, uh, being a big science fiction fan and reader of amazing stories, I knew that 185 North Wabash was only a block or so away from where I was stationed uh, with the Navy. Yeah, one so of the I made, it, I made it a point to get over there on, on my lunch hour one time. Yeah. And how and old I, are you now at this time? I was 18. 18. Okay. And tell me your feeling when you went, went into that office, into the Amazing City office. You, what did you say to someone? Well, I, I went up and explained that I was an artist, and I had worked for Fiction House already and done pulp illustrations for Fiction House. Oh, well, we have to get back to that after yeah. you tell me the, yeah. your, your amazing story. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, they, they ushered me in to see the editor of Amazing mm -hmm. Stories, and I knew his name, of course. But I was quite astounded when I first met him because no one had told me about his physical stature. Well, let, let our uh, listeners know. What about his physical stature? Well, uh, Ray, uh, how tall was he? About four and a half feet? Uh, roughly that, yeah. Yeah. And I was quite amazed, and I guess it must have shown on my face, but Ray is such a perfect gentleman. He, he didn't acknowledge it <laughs> well, if I did show shock. Did you ever find out why he never grew any taller? No. Well, no, I'll I tell you, since... Uh, uh, if I may interrupt, the fact that he had an accident as a kid, uh, a car accident, I don't know well, exactly, and it interfered with the growth of his yeah. spine or bones, so he never made more than uh, uh, four feet and a half, roughly. And I also was astonished, because there's no knowledge when I saw an illustration of his in Amazing Stories, or Wonder Stories, wherever it, it appeared, that he was of that stature. But of course, you just don't no. make it. But he was a wonderful well, oh. fellow, and uh, quite a character. And, oh, uh, he was Mr. Science Fiction in many ways absolutely. to me at that time. He was a brilliant conversationalist yeah. and, and a fairly good writer. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what did you talk to him about? Well, we, we discussed the fact that uh, I, I was doing... Did you bring any samples? Yes, right? I had some. I think I had some samples and in my uh, fiction house work. And did he give you a job, perhaps? That's yeah, he, he did give me an assignment, as I recall it, and he said there's no great time limit on mm -hmm. it when you can get it done. And uh, I was maybe a year after that before I actually delivered to him. But, and I know there are two ways editors would work. Number one way, they give you the, uh, the script and ask you to come up with a suitable illustration, tell you what size. Or perhaps, if time was of the essence, they would write out a paragraph or two describing what was happened and ask you at that point to do it and give you a deadline. Which way did your first look? Well, uh, Ray gave me a, about a... Uh, he sat and typed it right while I was there. He knew the story well. Mm -hmm. and he typed out a description of the scene, uh, what he wanted on it. Do you remember what story that was? I don't remember the name, but it had to do with a, a grandmotherly type sitting, I think, knitting. And there's some kind of exotic background behind her. You, and you have no recollection when that story appeared? It appeared shortly after the uh, war. You don't remember the title or anything like that? Not offhand. Uh, did you get any other sign? What was, uh, when you brought in the illustration, what, what was the reaction? That was afterwards, after I was out of the Navy. And all yeah, what was your reaction of the, uh, of the illustration you did? Did you get any more assignments? Yeah, they gave me, but, uh, but not long after that, uh, Ray uh, either left or he no longer handled that. I, I was turned over to the uh, art director, yeah. who was art director of all their magazines and books, yeah. a man named Herman Bolin. And Ray, or whoever the editor might be at the time, because it did change hands after Ray left, uh, they would do this similar thing, give me a little written description, and uh, uh, the art director would discuss it with me, and I would go up go well, and do but it. How many stories did you do for Amazing? How many illustrations? Amazing and fantastic? Yeah. I probably did over the years maybe, I would guess somewhere around 20, oh. uh, maybe 15 to that's, 20, that's I don't impressive. know. You were never asked to do a cover, obviously. No, right? no, no. 
Uh, we're going back in time. We skip around in this type of interview. You mentioned some illustrations you did for Fiction House. I assume they were comics? Well, I, when I started for Fiction House, uh, I came to New York. I left uh, uh, college because uh, I knew I was going to be drafted, and I wanted to be a, uh, try my hand at it. I'd had some uh, brief experience because of being this, uh, on the high school paper. We came to New York yeah. to a convention, and I met some of my heroes uh, back in 1943. Well, and who were that these was a Oh, Lou Fine and Jack Cole. And, well, who were they? Uh, well, you I know. <laughs> I know. You better tell the listening audience who they were. Well, Lou Fine uh, was perhaps my favorite uh, artist uh, uh, comics. and comics, comics and comic books. And uh, he uh, did a number of uh, early costume superheroes. You might Today they call them superheroes. Yeah. I don't think they call them that in those Probably days. Probably not, no. But he did the Doll Man, the Ray, Black Condor, the Flame. They were all great. Now, in looking at their work, did you get excited about it? Did you say, gee, I'd like to do Oh, it? yes, uh, absolutely. Well, how, I, did, how did you get your first assignment? Well, I came to New York. I dropped out of school. My dad thought it was a terrible idea, but he gave me a hundred dollars. He knew I was determined to do it. He said, "When the hundred dollars is gone, you have to come home." And the hundred dollars is gone. You're gone. Right? Yeah, that was it. But uh, I walked the streets for uh, for uh, a week, uh, uh, four days, I should say. Walking the streets doing what? Calling on everybody I could find in the yellow pages, every comic book company I ever heard Did of or knew about. What, what the, do you recall what the, under what category? Well, I don't remember. I knew the names of the companies, and I had oh, some so, of my books with me. So you know. did you go up to D.C. Comics? Oh, yes, again? I went to D.C. Comics. Well, what happened when you went up there? Oh, they, uh, they were very polite to me, but uh, come back when, you, <laughs> when, you're, uh, when you're a little uh, So you went from capable. company to company until when did you hit that jackpot? Well, I didn't hit the jackpot exactly I, I, as a last resort. Uh, I went down to call on Harry Chesler. I, I looked, looked Who's him Who's Harry up. Chesler? Harry Chesler had turned out some of the earliest comic books. He uh -huh. uh, uh, had done uh, uh, the larger size comic books, uh, All-Star Rangers, I think he called them, or Star Rangers and so forth. And some of the top men had uh, worked for him. Uh, uh, I could name them for you, but... It, uh, but no, we want to talk about you. All right. Uh, but anyhow, when I got there, he, uh, uh, I called him and he said, come on down, I, I'll talk to you. And uh, when, when uh, uh, I started talking to him, he said, well, I'm not, he looked at my work and he said, you know, it looks pretty good to me, but he said, you're not, uh, uh, he said, I'm not publishing any books at the moment. And he said, I think you'd be perfect for uh, Planet Comics. Ah, found? that was a nice time. Yeah. Planet Comics. Now we're getting into the heart of the matter. Yeah. So up you... Well, anyhow, he. Uh, I said, well, I've already talked to Mr. Iger, and he said uh, they're not hiring right now to come back in a couple Who of weeks. Who is Iger? Well, he had been uh, Will Eisner's partner, Jerry Iger, Eisner, Eisner and Iger. Uh -huh. And he ran a, a shop, uh, and they contracted with various publishers. And, and I, that, You're telling me that they, they would... Do the artwork and so on. And so, right, exactly. So that, many of the stories were written by uh, fiction house writers, yeah. but he, they, they would do them. Yeah. And I think they wrote some of their own material. But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, he uh, said, Iger, he said, that's not fiction house. He said, wait a minute. He picked up the phone and he called Jack Byrne at fiction house. And he gave me such a build-up, you wouldn't believe, over the phone. He Even said, though you hadn't done anything for them? Uh, right. Yeah. And he turned around to me and, and, and said, can you be up there in a half an hour or whatever? And I said, I'll try. You know. So you ran all the way. And I, and I got up to Fiction House and talked to Jack Byrne. He saw me immediately. And uh, he said, come in Monday, in effect. So you, ha you have no idea why he wanted you to get there Top speed. No, I mean it's he just. He didn't give a, you an assignment. No, he, it wasn't at top speed exactly, but they but they set up the appointment for okay. me. They they talked to me right, right so away. So comes Monday, yeah. and you're beside yourself. Oh, we can. <laughs> am I going to get that job? What kind of a job am I going to get? Well, I had out? the job. They they oh. hired me. On oh, Friday. they did. Okay. They told me just to report for work. And oh, you did, oh, you did not work at home. You worked in the office. Yeah. Oh, oh I yeah, said, well, that's important. Oh, I didn't yes. know that. Oh yes. 
That fiction house at that time uh, maintained a staff. Uh huh. They had freelancers also, but uh, uh, I would say about 50% of their work that they did themselves. Uh, was done on staff, and 50% was freelance, and then they they had a, a, a couple of books that were produced by uh, uh, Jerry Iger. I see. Is there by any chance any of those fellow artists, or even fellow writers, who were lately, later involved in science fiction in any way? Well, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Lee Elias was working there at the time, and you know, Lee, of course, worked with Jack Williamson on okay. uh, on a Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he well, we was got in the science fiction element right, yeah. right away. Very yeah. good. And, so, uh, let's but uh, but they also had their son, their pulp editors there, Julie. You know, yeah. an, uh, another little area. Yeah. They, uh, there are about four pulp editors that work there full time, and I got to know them obviously very soon. Uh, but any, go ahead. Well, go ahead. I, I was just wondering who they were. Well, Did Wilbur Peacock. Uh, uh, they were involved in, in Planet Stories? How many editors? Yeah, well, Wilbur was the editor Did they of have Planet Stories. Line of, they they had all their pulp, pulp editors. Magazine, their pulp, yeah. But they only had one science fiction that's, magazine. That's, that that's correct. Planet that's correct. Planet, had Planet Stories. Uh, Planet, <laughs> Planet <laughs> Stories. That had been running for quite a while before. Yeah, it had been running since about 1940. Now, you were given an assignment? And well, I talked to Wilbur, and he gave me an assignment. What What was that uh, assignment, do you recall? Oh, it was a story by Albert DePina. Uh, who was name? Albert DePina? No. I, uh, I just remember the name. Yeah. I, you, I thought you would know that. No, it sounds a little familiar, but I had not know. But uh, anyhow, it was a two-page spread, and I, I worked very hard on it and fi- on spare my spare time. Were you allowed to do your uh, No, that was ideas? after hours. I, I, I did that no, work. No, did they tell you what to draw? Well, were you allowed a certain amount of? Fear? Yeah, I think that he did give me a description, uh, or, now, or it, gave gave me a, a paragraph or something out of the story. To when illustrate. it came time to do uh, illustrations that may have involved your knowing, having a knowledge of science, if, for example, you had to do a planet or travel to space or or uh, anything science, where did you get your reference material? Oh, I, uh, immediately they had me. Uh, Jack Byrne gave me one of, uh, I guess my second assignment was to write and draw a filler for Planet uh, Comics. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, called Life on Other Worlds. And uh, they encouraged me to use Frank R. Paul because he was obviously a great favor of mine anyhow. Another reason, if I may interrupt, because uh, uh, Ray Palmer, when he was editor of Amazing and Fantastic Adventures, had Frank R. Paul oh. do a series of illustrations uh, on the right. back cover called uh, Life on Other Worlds. Right, other absolutely. <laughs> so that was a good reference. Yeah. And uh, I did those for, uh, I guess, most of my tenure on uh, uh, working for Fiction House. Yeah. Uh, I would write and draw these uh, uh, little three-page things, and they would edit them heavily. And uh, they would. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean they didn't go with the words that I put down, yeah. but they followed. But at least they had little, the concept. Yeah. Little concept. You were allowed to dream stories. up the concept yes, yourself. Yes, yes, and I dreamt up the characters how they would look, based mostly on Paul. They didn't ask me to follow him, yeah. but but uh, who could do better than Frank or no. Paul? Right. <laughs> right, so how many uh, all told? Uh, Illustra- uh, uh, stories that you illustrate for Planet. Oh, I did a regular feature for Planet. Uh, no, I'm talking about the stories themselves. Oh, Planet stories. Yeah, I'm talking about Planet oh. stories. Oh, I, I, I'm not sure. I, that uh, my work on Planet stories only uh, covered a couple of years. Well, how do we get from Planet stories to Planet comics? Well, Planet comics, I was hired to work on. I know. When did Planet comics? When, when, were the, when was the magazine published? I don't know what year. It was. Oh well, Planet Comics started about 1939, uh, I believe. Oh, so it's almost immediately after Superman and Batman appeared. Oh yes, Otherwise, yes. Uh, Superman did indeed create the comic book industry to yeah, a large extent. Right. I mean, uh, that's because of that success that many uh, uh, pulp publishers decided to start comics. Yes. And, uh, so. Uh, what did you do in Planet Comics? Did you have a feature of your own? Yes, I had a feature what, what called, called Star Pirate. Star, the Star Pirate. Yeah. And who wrote the story? Uh, different people, okay. but I think Claude Lapham did quite a bit of the plotting. Yeah, let's get into a little financial thing. We have no idea at this point in time 
what you were getting paid for this. Were you well paid, mediocre paid, poorly well, paid? Well, they, they told me, Jack Byrne said, uh, we'll start you uh, very low and see how you work out. Yeah, what was very low? And $30 a week. Uh, what was your reaction when he told you that? Well, I would have worked for $10. Well, there's your answer. So, that's <laughs> so you worked but your way up. But, but it became apparent after a couple of weeks I couldn't live in New York City on $30, yeah. you know. So that's when they encouraged me to take freelance. And also, uh, when I talked to Jack Burney, he said, yeah, he said, I understand that. And they raised me to 45. Yeah. I mean, they were very, really very generous. They weren't uh, tight fisted. Yeah. Now, you said some key words. They encouraged you or allowed you to... So it's Why to ride through freelance? Yeah. Tell me about this freelancing. Where did you go freelancing? Well, I freelanced only for Fiction House at that point, if that's what you're... Uh, no, no. How did you get involved in DC Comics? Uh, uh, well, that was years later. Oh, it's years later. Yeah. Now, this is... This is you, 1944 we're talking I, about. Are we, are we ready uh, to put you into the war? No, uh, just about. But, uh, but uh, I will tell you and remind people that might be listening to this that uh, this is Julie Schwartz's 50th year and, and uh, comics. Are you telling and, me you're in your 50th year? And are I you started, trying to take away my glory? I, I will tell you that I started to work within a week or so of the same date that you get. Well, as long as you didn't get ahead of me. So you're 50 <laughs> years sure. minus one week. And maybe it's a week before you. No, no. We're going to keep, <laughs> you, keep you on the minus. On the minus. I'll side. agree to that. Okay, okay. So, uh, so that that first job of yours, my first job was editing a uh, a, a Green Lantern story, I believe, in 1944. In February, and your first uh, job 50 years ago was doing what? A uh, star parent. Star parent. They had a script waiting for me when I came in Monday morning, and uh -huh. I sat down and started to work on it. And they sat me beside a guy whose work I'd known for years, and, and, and while he wasn't one of my top favorites, I admired his, his ability. And, and his name was? George Tusker. George Tusker. Seems to me he did some work for me for quite a while. Yeah. Well, you, you weren't influenced by George Tusker then? No, anyway. not really. Uh -huh. no. I, uh, let's get into D.C. since I, I would like to know how uh, um, what an important role I played in furthering your career. How, when and where did you go up to D.C. and what happened? Well, uh, of course, I, uh, I left Fiction House, to, uh, the staff position, to go in the Navy. And when I came back out of the Navy, I, I went back to work for them because I needed a job. And uh, But I had met my wife in Chicago. So after I worked for them for two or three months, I decided uh, uh, that I had to move back to Chicago. I just couldn't stand being separated uh, uh, from her like that. But uh, anyhow, I went back to Chicago, and we've discussed that already, the Buck Rogers uh, era. Uh -huh. And uh, then I went, uh, uh, got out of the comics altogether uh, after the Buck Rogers thing. And uh, but. I kept doing uh, pulp illustrations for Amazing and Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, one day I got a call from Herman Bolin, the art director, and he said, Murphy, are you interested in doing comic books? He said, we're starting a line of comic books in New York City. And I said, well, yeah, I, I would be interested. And he said, well, Jerry Siegel is, is taking is, is our uh Editorial director. Now, of course, this is the Jerry it's Siegel, the Jerry creator Siegel. of Superman. Absolutely. He's now involved or hooked up in some manner with Fiction House. No, with Ziff Davis. With Ziff Davis, excuse right. me. Right. And he was going to edit a line of comics? Uh, uh, yes, he was a cr uh, the creative or the editorial director for a line of new comics. What was your story. reaction when you heard that Jerry Siegel? Oh, I was quite impressed. Yeah, I would love to meet the man. And, uh, you know, Superman had long been a, my favorite uh, uh comic book character. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let's go up and meet Jerry Siegel together. What happened? Well, uh, uh, I got in touch with Jerry on the telephone because I was now, in Greensboro. He, he was in New York. Right, right, right. And he was in New York and he sent me a script and I felt it would be good to, to, to uh, I want to, uh, they gave me free reign. I lettered and inked it and brought it, uh, uh, brought it to them. He was impressive. Yeah. And he said, go ahead and do it. You don't have to bring it in. Just go ahead and follow the script. It was a tight script that Jerry had written himself. And uh, uh, send it in to us. And well, I thought I would deliver it and get to meet Jerry. And, and I did. And I was so impressed with the work they were planning. 
And he asked me if I'd be interested in moving back to the area because it would be much more convenient and he could assure me of plenty of work. So I, we made the decision, my wife and I, to move uh, uh, to New York. And uh, well, uh, How about the name of the magazines that Zip Davis was putting out? Well, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the comic book that I worked for was Amazing Adventures. Well, isn't that strange? Yeah. <laughs> amazing adventures. Yeah. Uh, and you not amazing stories, but amazing adventures. Yeah, okay. Yes. And uh, the first issue of that story I did was called uh, the uh, the asteroid witch. And the front cover was uh, of the comic was done by Robert Gibson Jones. And the, the other artist who had stories in the in the book were uh, Wally Wood. Uh, Alex Schomburg, uh -huh. uh, Ogden Whitney. Yeah, names that uh, made uh, their mark in the uh, uh, comic book right, right. right. So how long? What, so how long did that uh, uh, job, if you want to call it a job, or assignment last with the amazing? Well, the, the assignment, uh, the freelance work with uh, Ziff Davis was uh, uh, to last, uh, uh, you know, indefinitely. But uh, as it, as it worked out. Uh, I brought my a job in to Jerry shortly after we had moved and uh, leased an apartment, and he he was quite uh, abashed and told me he said Murphy he said I'm sorry, the writers haven't brought the the scripts up. He said I don't have a script for you today, oh. and I panicked. He said uh, he, he said it might be a week before we get another. I ran home, I got my samples, and I started calling on publishers. And I think the first that I called on was DC Comics. Ah, ha. Now you've got yeah. me interested. Let's go into detail. Well, uh, I talked to a gentleman named Murray Boltonoff. He said, Julie's not in today. He said, it's oh, wait, unusual. Wait, 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 wait. You asked to speak to me? No. Oh. He said, Julie's not in today, but he's the man you want to see. Oh, I see. Because he, he, he said, in science yeah, fiction. Right. He said, he said we're doing some new science fiction projects. Yeah. And... Uh, he said, I think you'd, you'd fit in very well. He said, come in tomorrow and you can speak to Julie. Uh -huh. So uh, I said, I, w I would, and I did. And I called on some other people, but we won't get into that. Right. And, so uh, here I am in less involved in your story, yeah. <laughs> which I recall nothing of. So you came the next day, and what happened? Well, you gave me a script. No, oh, wait a second. You just you looked at my work. We chatted yeah. for a while, and I guess uh, because I was a science fiction buff, and because I knew Ray Palmer and uh, had worked for him, and knew Jerry Siegel and was working for him, you were impressed enough to give me an assignment. And what was that assignment? Oh, it had to do with a comet, Julie. Not Captain, Captain Comet. Not, not oh, Captain Comet, but it, did uh, they, the Earth turned in, when the Earth turned into a comet? It might have been. It was some. No, I don't oh, think. Oh, the it moon was, turned into a comet. I, I don't. I don't cover really. that. All right. And anyway, that was your beginning with DC Comics. Right. Did, are we going to uh, eliminate Ziff Davis, or did you work for two companies? No, I for worked a, for two companies for yeah. a time, yeah. and uh, I continued with Ziff Davis, but. Uh, it was not long after that the Keefe overhearing started. Frederick Wortham's book came out, uh -huh. and uh, that sort of put a damper on the comics industry, and Ziff Davis uh, elected to, to discontinue their comics. How long did Ziff, Ziff Davis uh, magazines uh, last? Well, I think they lasted roughly until the final gasp, maybe four or five years uh -huh. altogether. Yeah. But, uh, but basically... I made the switch and, and started to work uh, for for DC because I felt they were a much more reliable uh, a company so you, to work for. So you worked mainly for Julie Schwartz? Only for Julie Schwartz in the How beginning. How lucky can you be? <laughs> well, that's difficult to, to, to be well, more lucky. Look where you are today and look where I am today. If you Well, all right. We're, so. si we're sitting in Dayton, Ohio. Neither one of us gainfully employed, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still 50 years, right? Uh, so how... You kept working for D.C.? Is that the only means of... Uh, no, uh, I worked for D.C. and then I did freelance assignments, uh, yeah. uh, some commercial work. But mostly it was work that uh, uh, came from D.C. Murphy, uh, uh, I assume the assignments... I gave you, we're not superhero stuff, but mainly science fiction, because I was putting out a number of science fiction comics. I remember Strange Adventures, Mystery in Space. Uh, was, 
That's well, correct. let's deal with those two. <laughs> well, in the beginning, I just did stories for you, but then Chris KL 99 became available, at least. Well, let me explain that those were a series of stories dealing with a future Christopher Columbus of space written by Edmund Hamilton. It uh, sounded me, very much like Captain Comet to me. Well, yeah, in a way it was. But uh, I was fortunate enough, knowing many science fiction writers, to have them write stories for me rather than a person who did. I remember right. Edmund Hamilton. It was mainly Wade Wellman. It was Otto Binder. There was a friend of mine named David Vrain, a writer named David V. Reed. Uh, John Broom. John Broom, who uh, started science fiction. I got him out of it to do comics mainly for right. me. I knew his name. Uh, there yeah. was Sam Merwin, who uh, yeah. had written, uh, who had become the editor of Thrilling Wonder. I had Horace Gold, who later became the editor of uh, Galaxy. And so I had a good science fiction uh, group working for me, writing scripts. And, uh, and I'm glad that you were given the assignment to illustrate some of the stories. Well, it was a great thrill for me because these were men that, whose work I knew in pulp magazines, and I was, uh, uh, you know, they were great favorites of mine. Now, at this point, you were not involved in Superman or anything else. There was strictly... Uh, no, strictly for you. Strictly I mean, for me. No, they, that was very uh, com- compartmentalized. Yeah. That's the word at D.C. And like I had artists working for me. I kept them what is called my yeah. stable. I, I right. that. Well, I was reliable. I, if you you came in for a script, oh. I had it ready for you. Oh, right. If you finished the script, I had a check ready for you. Exactly. So we got along fairly well. Yeah, exactly. Now, well, how long did that uh, at D.C.? Did you leave uh, after, a re- uh, after well, a while, any particular reason? Well, I left D.C. because I felt that I wanted to get into illustration. And I didn't leave, but I I, uh, I moved back to Greensboro. I bought the famous artist course, uh, the advanced course, and I wanted to apply myself and study it. Mm-hmm. But I realized that I couldn't do that without uh, working full time to support myself right. in comics. You were living in New York City all the time. Right, right. So uh, my wife and I decided after three years of uh, living and me freelancing in New York to to go back to Greensboro and work for my father at a job that would give me a lot more free time. And I recall I was horrified at the thought you were <laughs> dumping me. I didn't dump you. I continued to work I for know, you. But and I know. And I would come up every 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 two or three months, and we'd do covers together. Yeah. Well, why don't we tell them a little bit about how we worked out on covers? Now, when you said worked on covers, I, w- I did not give you a story to illustrate. No. Uh, or, or, or had a, nose, a story illustrated and say, let's get a, a scene out of it. We, uh, I thought a better idea to do it. I always yeah. wanted to do the most attractive covers, and it was was not always a decent cover, a, a story that would lend itself. So we worked it backwards. I said, let's do the covers first, get the most exciting covers we could do, and have a story written around. Right. Now, to, uh, re, let, well, let's see how we, how we went about doing that. Well, you would say to me, well, come in Wednesday morning. And we'll work on covers. Or maybe come in Wednesday afternoon and we'll work on covers, whatever time you had open. And uh, br- But bring in some sketches, some ideas. Yeah. I would bring in very crude, uh, tentative ideas, uh, little thumbnails. You would take a look at them and uh, see if you thought it had any potential. If it didn't, we jumped it. If you saw an idea that might have some potential or got you to thinking... Now, let's tell our, our listeners what we meant by potential. Was, was it simply an action scene? Well, no, not necessarily. It would have a, uh, maybe a scientific gimmick that you like. Or perhaps an emotional type of right, thing where exactly. you were concerned about uh, something or else happening. Right. And uh, well, I how quickly did we come up with cover? Well, sometimes well, how slowly did we come up? With sometimes you would uh, rubber stamp two or three at a time. Yeah, but we'd work I remember them out quite clearly. Me to go over, and then there would be days we came up. Oh, with there would be times when I'd sit there all day with you, and nothing would happen. Did I dare suggest perhaps you go to old science fiction book magazines and maybe take an idea or two? As a matter of oh, fact, oh no, no, no. no do what you, are you? Are you accusing me of <laughs> highway robbery? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Any, anyhow. So, and, and his cover. So you went to uh, old Pope's and came out with cover ideas. Well, what, what uh, you, we both uh, knew the old stories, yeah. and especially the startling and thrilling wonder stories, which were uh, uh, had covers that we both admired. 
So, Crazy enough that done by Maud Weiser, who yeah. was now in the, down the hall doing Superman and right, the exactly. Comics. But well, he I'm never not. made any comments when I uh, when I brought in, I showed him a cover that uh, it may have been inspired. He sort of smiled yeah. and. Uh, and uh, Mort and I always thought alike anyway. Yeah. He'd probably done much the same thing himself. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Probably about a fourth generation by the time I know we for did a fact it. that Mort went through old copies of amazing stories <laughs> from the early tw- from the late 20s right. and, and, and came up well, with Well, I ideas. brought in a, a stack of my books, and you kept them in the drawer. And when we'd be stuck, you would go out and pull out one or two or look through them yeah. and see if you could see anything that looked interesting. Ultimately, you told me to take them all home. I think we exhausted them yeah. uh, that particular batch. Well, we did come up with original oh, ideas. Yes. Oh, sure. Most, I would say 90% of our ideas were original, or at least not based on mm-hmm. that. That was sort of the last resort. And you could always find something that would... Be yeah, well, we, we skipped around. Last I recall you saying, you went back to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, worked right. for your father, and still worked right. in, in the industry. Yeah. How long did that last, and was there a change made? Uh, let's go to the next well, step up the ladder. So well, what happened, uh, of course, was... Uh, uh, 1958, I think it was, Sputnik went up. Okay. And uh, I got a call from uh, my friend Maury Brickman in Chicago asking, Hey, Murph, would you like to come back on Buck Rogers? Oh. And I said, Well, that sounds pretty good, you know. Uh, in the meantime, you had uh, contacted me about doing... Uh, we did a cover, and I'll, I'll digress just a second here. Uh, one of my ideas that I always wanted to work into a cover was a pit and pendulum idea. And uh, you agreed, but we could never come up with anything. But then we, we were kicking ideas around. You had an idea for a new character. Adam Strange. I'm going to scoop right. myself. Uh, it was Adam Strange, of course, and uh, we worked with the pendulum idea on that. And we worked all day, and the, the, uh, I had to catch a train. And I said, well, Julie, you know, you didn't like any of the sketches I was coming up with. So I said, I think I know what you want. Let me go home and do it. I, and if you don't like it, you don't have to use it. So I, I went home. I did, I did that first cover. Go ahead. The pit and pendulum idea. And uh, I sent it in to you, and you didn't like it. So you turned around and had Gil Kane redraw it. You worked with him, and you came up with a cover that was had the, the position and uh, you know showing the figure of Adam Strange like you wanted to. Yeah. I think and bringing the idea off. But that's neither here nor there. You had uh, asked me uh, I, more or less if I would be interested in working on this new feature, and uh, you, had had planned, you had planned Adam a Strange trip. Yeah, about. right. You had planned a trip to Florida. You were going down with the, with your wife and your nieces. Yeah. And I invited you to stop back in Greensboro and visit us, which you did. But in the meantime, I got the call from Chicago, and they were asking me. They had they flew me up there to help them bail them out of a, a situation where Rick Yeager uh, uh, had demanded more money, and they said no. They wouldn't give it to him. And they made negotiated a deal with me to take over the daily and Sunday, and that, and uh, an effort to get the thing ahead, they uh, uh, they had me come in and uh, work on a couple of uh, sets of dailies, get them done real quick. They got me someone down the, the hall. The scripts were already done. You just had to sit down and illustrate. they were written. They yeah. they had me sit down and illustrate them. They even got a guy to help me a little bit, and he did a week on his own who uh, is fairly well-known these days. Who's that? Dick Loker. Does well, Dick Tracy. Well known. Does Dick Tracy. Oh, well, you and may he's know he's won that. the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartoons. Oh, well, big deal. <laughs> let's let's but, talk about the important things in life. So they are uh, stuck in Chicago doing Buck Rogers. Well, and they, I went back home. They, uh, I came in for a weekend. We discussed everything, and uh, I helped bail them out a little bit, and... Uh, 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 well, I, maybe I was there for about a week now that I think about it. Did a couple of Sunday pages, penciled them, and, uh, and, and went back and inked them. And uh, uh, at that time, you came, came along to visit me in Greensboro. About the, this, the time may not be exactly right. Well, uh, roughly. I... But uh, uh, I think you were a little chagrined that I wasn't going to do uh, work with you on Adam Strange. 
But I think you were in my corner and were happy that I had gotten the Buck Rogers thing. Oh, yeah, thing. sure. And uh, I asked you about riding it, but they were looking for a rider desperately. And you uh, uh, said, if you ride it, I'll edit it. <laughs> I did and, say that? Yeah. You, I'm not allowed to do a thing like that. No, you weren't under contract at that point in time. Well, I, I, was, I was on staff. It's yeah, the same but thing. I mean, freelance, you could freelance. Uh, I would never take a freelance. Uh, it didn't happen. Maybe, oh, it didn't maybe, happen. Uh, but you were, uh, I think, perhaps uh, uh, didn't know, didn't want to uh, brush me off too, <laughs> All right, too let, abruptly. Let's get on. But anyhow. Uh, I have always felt you would have done a masterful job. No question, a super job. Yeah, it's super. Well, at that time, uh, well, I way ahead of the time. Or a Green Lantern or something. Yeah, right. kind of so, how long did that uh, did the new uh, Buck Rogers episode number two last? Well, I had many of the same problems come back to haunt me. <laughs> even <laughs> even though uh, there was a change of uh, uh, management. Well, a, a change of uh, what. Uh, crew, I guess, yeah. uh, running the thing. But uh, so I left uh, the strip again, and uh, since I'd given up my situation in Greensboro to do this, the Buck Rogers thing, uh, my kid brother came to work for my father about that time, and there wasn't, the, this was a depressed time, if you remember, not only in, in the comics because of the, the Senate hearings, the Wortham uh, thing. Uh, uh, comics were under the comics code, and uh, Marvel Comics was almost out of business. So we're probably in the, in the late quit. 50s? Yeah, in the late 50s. Uh, this is 1959. I came uh, came back, I made the decision to move back and just take my chances finding work. And uh, they were about the only assignment you could give me at that point was inking assignments because one of your uh, chief anchors had quit. Mm -hmm. And that you had that available, so <laughs> go ahead. That's all right. No, we, 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 your, uh, your voice carries yeah. over there. Uh, anyhow, um, you came back to New York, yeah, and yeah. you got inking jobs. What I kind had, of inking jobs are they? Well, getting? I think one of the first jobs you gave me was a, a science fiction story by Gill. Then you asked me if I could ink Carmine Infantino. Uh -huh. You had me do a, a flash, I think. Uh -huh. And uh, about that time... Uh, now, wait a second. Maybe I, I, I have, strange. I have to interrupt you because I think I've forgotten an important element. Didn't you do the Captain Comet stories? Oh, yes. yes well, I, I just want to get this in for people listening in that many people talk about the revival of superheroes in comics and they give credit to someone called John Jones from Mars... Uh, which appeared many years later. I, I believe I deserve the credit for bringing back in the, in the, the revival, you might say, of superheroes with Captain Comet. Now, many people object that, well, Flash was dying out at that point, Greenland, so right. it was... But I believe that there can always be a little overlapping, and I did Cap we did Captain Comet for how many issues? Oh, Captain Comet lasted for several years. Well, I there you are. So I think uh, right now you and I get credit for reviving superheroes... <laughs> When they had all gone down the drain except Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman. Okay, so, but I digress. Sorry, Peter David, but I digress. That's an inside joke. Yeah, I, I got it. Okay. I know, uh, Peter. All right, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, so you did the inking. Uh, uh, did you get involved with Superman at this point, by any chance, or is that no, to come later on? No, uh, I think I may have, over the period of years, done a few covers to bail out, you know, when Morton yeah. would have a problem you would lend me to the ink. Well, even though I may have given you only inking assignments, I clearly remember oh, giving no, you no. A, a complete assignment called the Atomic Knights. Right. I think I bugged you so much, and uh, maybe uh, uh, you uh, uh, felt sorry for me. So you... you uh, no, I always liked your complete artwork. <laughs> I had, uh, no, no problem. I think I may have needed an ink more than I needed a pencil. Yeah, that, that's it. That's yeah. the way the system... So you're going to bother the Atomic Knights. Uh, right. And uh, just let the uh, listeners know that uh, this is uh, after World War Three, when the atomic uh, uh, holocaust practically wiped everything out. But fortunately, people who had uh, worn armor from the Middle Ages, for some reason, was able to ward off the radiation. And these were the atomic knights went looking across the country for any survivors on the world. And we went from city to city, and now we come to New Orleans. And right. what happened in New Orleans, <laughs> Mr. Anderson? Well, uh, New Orleans, I think, was contrived by 
Mr. Schwartz and Mr. Broom, who were, were great jazz fans. And this Traditional excuse, jazz fans, yes. It was a great excuse for them to work jazz under the Atomic Absolutely, Nights. right. And in fact, we, we based the story on the fact that uh, the whole story would be resolved by playing a, well, uh, a familiar New Orleans to- tune, melody called When the Saints Go Marching In. Right, it seemed right. that New Orleans had been dominated by uh, King, King Toro. Yeah. I believe it was called. He had people mesmerized. Mesmerized. And the only way he could break the spell is have, have the band go up and down the streets playing when the Saints go marching in. When that story appeared in print, I get a letter from the New Orleans Jazz Museum. Why don't you continue the story? Because this is your story. Well, you know, I like to get my original artwork back when I could. Because Julie had a, a, a deal we're going in his books where he gave away original artwork for the best stories. I mean, best letters that the readers would send out. Uh, and that particular story I had my eye on, I would like to, to, uh, to have the original art back. But he came in and showed me the letter and took hold of my arm and twisted it about what three, did that three, 360 say? degrees well, that, and said, uh, can we send the artwork to the, well, the I museum? I don't think we explained that. We heard from the New Orleans Jazz Museum yeah. that they loved the read the story and liked to display it. Yeah. And since the title was the King of New Orleans, it yeah. sort of appealed to them. So um, I made you, I broke your heart <laughs> and, and sent it down arm. to New Orleans. And that's the last I heard of it, except what happened, my feet? Well, just recently, my wife and daughter had occasion to be in New Orleans, and I told my wife, since you're going down there, uh, why don't you see if you can uh, look up the uh, the drawing, uh, the drawings, and see if the the jazz museum actually has them yet, displaying them, Dis- yes. well, and more importantly, if they're displaying them. Well, she inquired and found that uh, there was no more uh, jazz museum in New Orleans. Horrors. And uh, but she was tenacious, and she pursued it, uh, someone told her and her inquiries that uh, they thought that it had been merged with the uh, uh, new uh, the Louisiana Museum uh, Museum of Art or well, something State along that line. Anyhow, anyhow, she pursued that and she found the museum in question and walked in and there lo and behold in the lobby area before you pay your money to get into the museum was a display case with a page of the Atomic Nights and a copy of Strange Adventures. So with, uh, it came to a happy conclusion. Right. Uh, well, I'm glad that it, that art is still preserved because it's certainly one of my favorites. Yeah. So you were involved doing these Atomic Nights stories. What else were you doing in this uh, general uh, time? Well, were you doing any uh, original... Uh, I did covers for you. Yeah. Uh, any uh, other uh, uh, pencil and ink jobs you were doing? An occasional yeah. science fiction, perhaps. You know, not. Uh, yeah, I did quite a few science fiction stories for you, and uh, then uh, uh, you had uh, started trying out uh, uh, golden age comic characters. Ah, yes, Black Canary and uh, well, Doctor Fate. You right, you, but earlier than that, you brought back Flash and Green Lantern and the Atom. Yes, and they needed anchors. All of them. They? I mean, I needed inkers. Well, the, these features needed inkers. Yeah, but I needed the inkers. All right. <laughs> All right, so you did a number of those. But it seems to me, let's get into something before we run out of tape, before we run out of breath. At what point in time did you get involved with Will Eisner? Well, Will Eisner. Is that before or after what we're talking about? No, it's after uh, what you're well, talking Well, let's skip about. to the Will Eisner period. All right, now. well... Things uh, progressed, and uh, lo and behold, Julie uh, gave up most of his science fiction uh, titles. I think. Oh, you well, let it make it clear. I did not give them up. I was persuaded to relinquish my hold on the science fiction magazines and do Batman, because right. Batman was in trouble, and uh, they hoped I would do as well reviving Batman and giving it a new look as I had succeeded with Flash, Green Lantern, and Justice League. Correct. And that was 1964. Right. And uh, well, you had had me uh, uh, doing some of these revivals. I did Hawkman, uh, and ultimately we yeah. But the, these were book. these were revivals but, and a limited basis. They appeared in either Showcase or Brave and Bold. Right. Well, Joe Kubert did the uh, the Hawkman tryouts. Yes. And uh, but then when the time came to assign a regular artist, you in the Sun magazine, I I appealed to Murphy Anderson. Yeah. Well, I think Joe couldn't uh, possibly no, have done the, the, the feature. He didn't want to get involved. Yeah. He, he couldn't get involved. No. Yeah. He was too involved in other uh, uh, commitments. But uh, anyhow, 
I did start the Hawkman feature and drew it for the next 21, 22 issues, I so think. We're talking about completely. at least two years or more. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's no, get four, that, that translates oh. into three and a half years, oh, yeah. bi-monthly. Oh, oh, but yeah. since it was a bi-monthly and I could do a book a month, yeah. uh, you had other tryouts. Starman, Black Canary, Dr. Yeah. Fate and Iron Man, the Spectre. Right. And uh, the Spectre finally hit, uh, was, had a good, a good enough response, you decided to start a Spectre magazine. Mm. But in the meantime, the Batman phenomenon was, up, was upon us. And, uh, That's about 1966, 67? Yeah, something like that. And uh, during uh, the Batman craze, I was pulled away from other assignments to do many, many special projects for, for DC. Uh, uh, commercial projects where someone would get a license to do Batman and they'd, they'd need help, uh, uh, need artists to, to work on it. So, uh, but... After the Batman craze started to die out, uh, I heard that Will Eisner uh, was looking for someone to work uh, uh, in his studio. Doing went, what? Doing what? Well, Will Eisner was contracting with the U.S. Army on a, a magazine called P.S. Magazine, a magazine of preventive maintenance, a monthly magazine that went to all the troops that had anything to do with maintenance in, in the Army. And uh, he offered me a position, a regular salary, insurance, uh, retirement, the whole bit. In other words, it's a better deal looking well, into the future than just right. I mean, doing just freelancing. Uh, my experience had been kind of while I was busy most of the time. It was a, a very frightening to not know for sure that you're going to have another job and what's the future. There's, I needed insurance. I had a bad in insurance experience about that time, and. Uh, the whole thing looked attractive to me, so I couldn't get in to see Irwin for weeks. I tried to see him. We're uh, talking about Irwin Donovan, yeah, who was the editorial director right, at DC right, at, at this that point. Time. And uh, finally, I told Will he offered the job, gave me a time limit that I had to let him know. And I, I said, Well, I'll have to take it. I can't uh, finalize anything with Irwin. He knew my situation. So he uh, so I took, it, took the job and went down to work for them. And... Uh, Irwin uh, got a little upset with me, and I think uh, a deal I'd made with you was that I would continue to do the Spectre. Yeah. It would start started it, and uh, I think uh, uh, Irwin was uh, unhappy enough he wanted someone else to do the Spectre. And uh, at that point, uh, I was cut off and was only doing uh, work for Will. Yeah, no DC assignments. No at DC all. assignments for about six months or so. Right. Uh, we, we didn't want to get too involved with the, with Will Eisner because it really didn't help us as far as our angle with getting into science fiction. No, no. Okay. So how long did that last? That lasted approximately two and a half years. And what was the next uh, well, stage I, of your Well, I did make my peace uh, with uh, the powers and you came back to D.C. And, and I did do work three lights. What, did I, get, what did I give you to you do? You gave me Hawkman, uh, Adam, uh, Book, I think. Well, you were inking uh, Gil Kane and Carmine. Well, I penciled some of those, and yeah. I inked uh, Gil Kane and Carmine again. And about that time, uh, uh, after I left Will, or decided to leave Will, uh, you were given another assignment. A super assignment. A super assignment, is right. To, to do what I did for Superman, what I did for Batman. And right. I said I would do it on a number of uh, agreements that I could do anything I wanted with Superman to a certain degree. Not yeah. in, but one thing I did insist, I wanted the Kurt Swan Murphy Anderson team to work on it. Uh, Kurt Swan, his last name ending in A-N, Murphy Anderson's name beginning with A-N, became Kurt... Uh, well, Swanderson. 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 So, all right. So you you worked on Superman for many, many issues, as I recall. Right, right. For about three and, years, uh, I guess. Where do we go from there, if anywhere? Well, at that point, uh, things had changed drastically at D.C., uh, and I would never, I didn't feel very secure there any longer. And uh, I heard that the P.S. magazine contract, which Will had lost, uh, uh, was up, well, the was up again. They were not happy with the new contractors, yeah. and they l let me know about the way of the grapevine. Uh, that I, they would entertain uh, uh, me making a bid on it. So I had to do the necessary things to bid on a government contract. I had to form a company and have a 
studio and all all these things. And uh, anyhow, Silent, yeah. anyhow, I wound up uh, to make a long story short uh, as contractor on PS Magazine, and that was 1973, and pretty much ended my uh, my years in comics on a steady basis. On a steady now basis. Now we both. So you're doing now. Well, in the interim. You couldn't keep me busy yeah. uh, after I came back, but Joe Kubert had taken over the Burroughs material from yeah. D.C., and he had a feature called John Carter right. that he was interested in me drawing. One of your favorites, too. Right, actually. exactly. So that got me back into science fiction. So you're doing penciling and inking? Penciling and inking okay. for Joe. Yeah. But that, did that last very And long? I did Korak for a time. That, that didn't last too long, though, did it? Well, he kept me busy that uh, part of it. Uh, and you were doing nothing for, uh, for I was doing work. Oh, no, I was doing work for Julie oh. Schwartz, of course, oh. all along. Well, let's, let's get into uh, the next phase of your career. How did you get involved in doing color separations? Well, and working for uh, the Army on PS Magazine, the contract uh, uh, specified that the contractor had to uh, uh, supply film ready for the printer. And that meant uh, we had to do all the production, uh, everything, and, until the final film was generated. We had to do the separations and supply that film, ship it to the printer, the printer made his plates and printed, printed the magazine. So we developed the, the ability to do color separations in our firm. And uh, after 10 years on PS Magazine, I decided that uh, it was time to, for a change and uh, declined to bid on the contract again. And uh, at that point, uh, we started doing color separations for DC and other companies. I don't know, just to get toward the end of the tape, is more or less what you've been doing now. You do an occasional job by special request. Right. Uh, you, you, you go to conventions, you go to comic book conventions. Have you gone to science fiction conventions at all? Uh, no science fiction. Well, the science point fiction. is that many comic book conventions are strongly science fiction related. So we manage, I know, uh, uh, I just want to put on the record that uh, Murphy Anderson will be uh, one of the guests of honor at the San Diego Comic Convention this year. But there'll be science fiction people there. There'll be Roger Selazny as a guest, uh, Michael Whalen as a guest. So you see how many of the comic book conventions are now science fiction related. And uh, at this moment in time, we're here at PulpCon, and Murphy and I came out to enjoy ourselves socially. We're not really involved in wheeling and dealing in comics, and uh, we would, had, had hoped to get a free dinner out of this, but uh, Ray Beam <laughs> said, no, no, we'll do it some other time. But one final thing is that Murphy agreed to do uh, some sketches for Ray Beam and Buck Rogers. They're not quite finished, but they're going to be finished next time we meet. And that's about it. So, Murphy, thank you very much. Over and out. <coughs> that's it. My voice is dying. That, that's a beer. Huh? Thanks,